I was recently sent an orc boarding patrol by Games Workshop, and inside this box is a brand new plastic snickrot. And this got me thinking about other orc characters that are yet to be reimagined in glorious grey plastic. One of these iconic individuals is the Mad Doc Grotznik, whose original model has been out of production for some time now. And so, using the new Snickrot model as a base, I began the process of bringing back Grotznik from the brink of death once again. To begin, I set about clipping away Snickrot's legs and torso before removing any mold lines and tabs. The first change to be made was the removal of the skull tabard. While it pains me to remove some perfectly good dead animal bits, these would be replaced with something closer to the original model. But first the skulls were clipped and trimmed back so that just the belt buckle remained, but the legs could still fit together without leaving any gaps. The replacement tabard came from the orc knob sprue and just needed a little bit of slight trimming in order to allow it to better fit against the belt. Once things were lining up, the tabard was glued into place. Both of Grotznik's arms have been replaced with cybernetics, with his right arm in particular featuring a power claw. Now, there are lots of choices for orc power claws, but this one from the Commandos is a particularly good pick. First of all, it has that stitched flesh which also features on Grotznik and is also present in the same boarding patrol that Snickrot came from. To get this arm to fit against the torso, however, it did require the small section of fabric on the shoulders to be clipped and smoothed away. Once done, the arm itself was glued to the torso, but the claw wasn't fully constructed just yet. Don't worry about the gaps here either, as these will be filled in later on. For the left arm, I would look towards the flesh kits, also found within the boarding patrol, and grab these two arms. The mech hand was perfect, but I wanted it to be holding a pistol rather than a blade. To make the swap, the blade was first clipped away, with a few trims being made so that just the hand remained intact. Similarly, the pistol from the second arm was clipped away where it joined the hand. I played close attention to here so that as much of the pistol was retained. The pistol and the mech hand were compared and trimmed so both parts were fitting together, but I didn't glue them together just yet. First, I had to make sure that the shoulder could fit against the torso. Like with the left arm, a little clipping and trimming was required, but it wasn't necessary to get a perfect fit. Once the arm was glued, the pistol was glued to the hand. You could use pins if you preferred, but the contact point was fairly large and would hold onto the part securely enough. Attaching the head was extremely straightforward. I simply used one of the Snickrot heads that has the goggles down. This negated any need for further trims while still keeping that mechanical theme going. One change I did make, however, was to attach an iron gob. This was taken from the knobs kit, but there are lots of places to source these from. Before attaching Snickrot's backpack, I decided to clip away and shave back the tab on the side where you'd normally attach the blade. From here, the pack was glued to Grotznik's back, but there were still some modifications to be made. The first of these was a tank taken from the flash kits. Some of the inner struts from this part were removed and shaved flat before being glued to the right hand side of the pack. To join this newly added tank to the power claw, the original power claw cable would be used, but it required some shortening. This was done steadily, following a few comparisons to ensure that the length was just right. Once the length was correct, the cable was glued into place, completing the link between the arm and the pack. From here, the power claw would continue to be assembled, but the protruding cable was first clipped away. Just keep this component safe for the time being. After gluing the claw together, the removed cable was attached to the left arm, creating a bridge between the pack and the arm, helping to further sell that mechanical effect. In some of the artwork for Grotznik, his power claw is equipped with a circular saw, no doubt to make hacking up his patients and victims all that much easier. Again, these are quite common across orc kits, but this particular saw was taken from the Squig Hogs kit. The saw and its struts were clipped from the weapon before being trimmed and flattened out. After a quick comparison to the side of the claw and a few more trims, the saw was glued into place. With most of the model built, it was now time to add a few extra details to the miniature. The first of these was an exhaust from the flash kits, which was again trimmed down and attached to the side of the backpack, giving it the impression of housing some sort of combustion-powered machinery. This was followed up with some syringes taken from the Drukhari Rax kit, 
four of these were attached across Grotznik's shoulders, helping to further push that mad dog look. Another detail from the original model was a syringe attached to the pistol. I would fabricate one of these from an orc stick bomb and some plastic rod by first drilling a 1mm hole into the end of the stick bomb. The rod was glued into the hole before being cut at an angle, leaving a few millimeters of protruding needle. The end of the stick bomb was removed from the stick, flattened out and glued to the side of the pistol. The final task in building this Mad Doc Grotznik was to add further stitching whilst also covering up some of those gaps. This would be achieved with green stuff, so a small amount was cut and mixed together. The green stuff was then rolled into thin sausages before being laid across the seam between the arm and the torso. Using a silicon tip tool and a little Vaseline to prevent sticking, the green stuff was then blended into the surrounding musculature. Once I was happy with the blending, I used my scalpel and more Vaseline to carefully scour a line down the center of the green stuff, essentially reintroducing the seam, albeit in a more defined manner. Following this, several smaller and perpendicular lines were added along the length of the seam to create the appearance of stitch marks. Now, you can leave the stitching as is, but if you want to add that little extra level of detail, you can roll out some extremely thin and extremely small pieces of green stuff. After making a few of these, I then carefully laid them on top of the stitch marks. They did require a little pressing down though, to look as though they were actually embedded in the skin. But once this has been completed on the right arm, I then repeated the same steps across the left. After this, the putty was left to cure before I began the painting. When it came to painting the Mad Dog, I wanted to begin with some Xenophil shading, which meant that I first needed a black primer coat. This was applied across the whole model using my airbrush, but some regular spray can paint could have been used instead. The actual Xenophil aspect of this starting point was created by spraying a light grey from above the model. The paint formed only on the upper surfaces, helping to create the effect of light falling on the model when the sun is directly above or at its zenith. I specifically chose Cock Harrod and Grey from the Tooth and Coat range for this, but feel free to use whatever light grey you have to hand and whatever method of application you prefer, be it airbrush or rattle can. The results are, by and large, the same. The airbrush will give you a greater degree of control though, which you can take advantage of by applying less paint to the areas that you wish to remain black. The reasoning behind the Xenophil shading was to allow me to make use of some of Express Paints from Vallejo. Now these are similar in concept to Games Workshop's contrast range, in the sense that they are translucent paints, which allow you to create a contrasting effect with a single layer of paint. By flowing easily over the miniature surfaces, settling in all the reliefs and more intensely in the crevices of the figure, it's basically a quick and simple way of achieving gradients, which can then be further enhanced by doing things like pre-shading. Now, where these paints can be used undiluted, I wanted to have more control over their strength, so mixing some Express Color Medium in equal parts into my base color, which is Orc Skin in this case. The resulting mixture is more translucent, but maintains those desired properties. Unsurprisingly, this paint was applied across all of the exposed flesh of the Orc. You can see that I applied it quite generously in order to get that shading effect, but I was still careful with exactly where I applied it. After allowing the first layer to dry, in the areas that I felt needed more saturation of color, such as in the more shaded areas, I applied a second layer. Now before I go on, I just want to say a big thank you to my friend and fellow YouTuber Juan Hidalgo for sending me over these paints. If you want to see a true master of these kinds of paints at work, I'd highly recommend checking out his channel. From here, I continued in very much the same way as I did in the last step. I mixed an express color paint into some medium and then applied it in a couple of layers. For leather details on the model, such as the pack, belt, boots, and other straps, I used some wasteland brown. For the areas that I wish to be black, such as the trousers, power claw, pistol, and details around the head, I used some black lotus. But before I continued, there were a few areas that I'd missed with the zenithal highlight that would need to be lightened up a little. Paints like Express Colors work best over lighter base coats, so to remedy this, I took a little more cock carrot and grey and brush painted a few of those areas that I'd missed. Of course, if you're a bit more sensible than I am, then you probably won't need to worry about the step at all. 
I could then return to applying the express colors, starting off with some more plasma red. This was focused onto the cables, the grenade on the chest, and the syringes. I also tackled the rope affixed beneath the pack with this paint, resulting in more of a bundled electrical cable effect rather than a rope. Some deep purple was then very carefully applied to the inside of the mouth. If you do spill onto the teeth here, don't worry. You can simply clean up by applying a little more of your grey paint over the top of them. The aforementioned teeth, as well as the stitching in the pack and trousers, were then coated with some nuclear yellow. Before finishing off the express colour base coats with some Templar white, which was applied across the loincloth and the skull emblem on the pack. The only base coats left to tackle now were the metallics, and for these I returned to the two thin coats range, specifically Sir Coat Silver. This was diluted with a little water and painted across the areas of steel on the model, paying careful attention so as I didn't overspill into the areas that I'd already painted. After the first layer, a second coat was applied, creating a more smoother coverage. My final base coat was Spartan Bronze, which was used to pick out the remaining metallic details. After this step, I made sure to replace my paint water to prevent cross-contamination of my paint into my subsequent paints. With the base coats in place, I could then start to bring out the details by adding shading and highlights to the surfaces. Like with the base coats, these would follow a similar process as I tackled each colour individually. The first bit of shading that was applied was focused across the skin. Here I used some Caribbean turquoise, thinned out with more medium. This was targeted into the recesses and lower areas of the skin. Here, the darker paint helps to emphasize the shading and deepen those recesses. Simultaneously, the cooler tone of the turquoise helped to add an extra degree of separation from the warmer yellow greens, whilst also giving the skin's color a little more variation in tone. After shading, I could start applying some highlights to the raised details. Normally, I just use paints that are similar in color to the base coat, but are a little lighter. With express colors, you can easily make your own by adding the paint you used to the base color to a light tan paint, such as Ivory Tusk from the Tooth and Coats range. From this, I created two highlights, one by mixing the paints in equal amounts, and a second by adding more paint than express color to create an even lighter version. I applied the darker of the two mixes as a regular highlight. By applying a thin line of this across the raised details, the lighter paint helps to lift it away from the darker surfaces that sit adjacent. This, in turn, helps for these details to stand out a little more and prevents the model surfaces from looking flat and shallow. Once the skin had been highlighted, I then used the lighter of the two mixes as an extreme highlight. Rather than painting this onto all of the edges, I instead focused this paint onto just the points where two edges met, resulting in a sharper finish. To finish off the skin, I wanted to add a slightly purplish hue to the edges of the stitch skin, the lips and the ears, and for all of these I used more medium diluted deep purple. This slightly adjusted the tone of the green and gave it more of a human flesh tone, further separating them out from the green skin. In order to darken down a few of the other recessed areas, I mixed in a little black lotus into my original base colour, wasteland brown in this case and applied it in a similar way to how the previous Caribbean turquoise was added. By targeting this darker mix directly into the deepest recesses, it allowed me to push those shadows created by the initial layer even further. I then followed this up with a couple of highlights created by mixing together some wasteland brown and ivory tusk. The black areas didn't need their recesses darkening, so I went straight into my two highlights created from black lotus and ivory tusk. For the red details, the recesses were targeted with a mix of Plasma Red and Black Lotus, which was then followed up with a couple of highlights of Plasma Red and Ivory Tusk, before highlighting the teeth and fabric stitches with a mix of Nuclear Yellow and Ivory Tusk. To highlight the white areas of the model, like the loincloth and the skull symbol, rather than using a mix, I used Carcaridon Grey on its own, followed up with some White Star for the extreme highlights. When it came to adding definition to the metallic areas, I once again made use of the Express Colors range by diluting the paint with the medium as normal, but then mixing in a little water in order to reduce the viscosity of the mix. This allowed me to use it as a wash. I did this first with Black Lotus and used it to bring out the recesses in the silver metallic areas. 
By diluting the mix, it also brought out the slight blue tone in the paint, helping to give the metal that oily look. This was then repeated across the bronze areas using some wasteland brown, which gave me a more subtle shadow than the Black Lotus would have done. Following the washes, the highlights could resume. I began with plate armor and used this to pick out the edges of the silver areas, before adding some extreme highlights of Mithril Blade to the sharper points. The bronze details were then highlighted with Dragon's Gold, with the metallics being finished off with some glistening gold. Like before, my paint water was refreshed following this step. All that was left to do now was to add those last few details. The first of these were the optics on Grotznik's goggles. I began by picking out the lenses for some White Star, providing me with a good, light base color in which to add more Express Color too. To create a glowing blue effect, more Caribbean Turquoise was applied across the lenses. Again, this was steadily built up until I had the desired glowing effect. Finally, some dried blood and gore was added to Grotznik's loincloth by splattering about some velvet and plasma red. All that was left to do now was to tackle the base. I wanted a desert Badlands-like base, and to create this I applied a thick layer of AK Interactor's dry ground. This textured paste was built up across the base, paying close attention not to overspill onto the model itself. By applying this quite thickly, it allowed me to add a little surface variation and therefore a greater degree of realism. After giving the paste plenty of time to dry, I hit it with another wash created from Wasteland Brown. This seeped into all of those many recesses, helping to bring out the detail. Detail that would be enhanced even further by giving the base a quick dry brush of Ivory Tusk. All that was left to do now was to clean up the rim of the base with some Doom Death Black before giving everything a coat of varnish, which left me with this. And here we have the finished Mad Dog Grotznik. While the result isn't an exact remake of the original, it was never my intention to create a copy. I instead wanted to imagine how the model might look should Games Workshop ever re-release him. I've kept some of the more iconic details, such as the mechanical parts and stitches, and his size helps him to stand out as a formidable character, rather than just a regular pain boy. It's also nice to return to an orc kit bash for a change. If you enjoyed seeing me tackling these fun guys, and would like to see more, leave me your suggestions in the comments below. I'm also really pleased with the paint job. This is the first time I've made use of the new range of Vallejo Express paints, and I'm very impressed with them. With just a base layer and a couple of highlights, you can create some great results without having to worry about tedious glazing. Once again, a big thank you to Juan for sending me a box of these. I'll include some links to his channel below, which you should definitely check out. For those of you looking to recreate this miniature and color scheme, I'll include all the kits and paints used in this guide in the description below, along with some affiliate links to where you can pick them up for yourself. Now before I go, let me just say a big thank you to my Patreon supporters and channel members who helped keep this channel going, especially my expert tier and above supporters who are Jonathan Hart, Maciej Savitsky, Tim, Daniel Dowling, Jochen Falk, Johans, Jonathan Sandsteed, Casper Limborg, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, Pale Juice, Swedsman, and the Googles. And my Sergeant Level channel members who are Fair Statement, Mr. Jared Hess95, Nonington Paints, Mark Taylor, Whale Tussler, and Philip Poyer. If you're interested in supporting me too, you can hit the join button below or find a link to my Patreon in the description. Supporters get a whole host of benefits, including ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Speaking of merchandise, I also have a few t-shirts and mugs up for sale featuring designs drawn by me. You can pick those up by following the links below or by going over to PeteTheWarGamer.com. So until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.